no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Well, good morning and welcome, especially to our guests. We have a number of guests with us today. We're always privileged to, to have guests, and we uh, thank you. You've honored us by being here, and we want to uh, show you our appreciation and get to know you better. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, be thou our guard while life shall last and our eternal home. Before the hills in order stood or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God to endless years the same. This was a hymn written by Isaac Watts in the 1700s. Originally there were nine verses to this hymn and uh, the four that we sang are the ones that are normally sung. Patrick tells me that it's been set to several different tunes and that's the particular tu tune in our hymn book. I've never sung it before. I don't know if you had or not. But I ran across this, these verses and, and these two verses that I brought out and especially the two last lines really hit me. From everlasting thou art God to endless years the same. Hence the title of my lesson for today, To Endless Years the Same, A Definition of Worship. If you had a friend that was enamored with the New Age concept of religion, and you wanted to talk to him about the distinctives of Christianity, you perhaps would not talk about how the Holy Spirit can enlighten us. Now you could because the Bible is full of references to, to light, how that we are the light of the world and how that, that the other rich images show that there's light that dispels the darkness and, and how that the Spirit shines in our hearts. So you could talk about those things but this new age devotee then would probably lump Christianity right along with Hinduism and Buddhism and whatever other Egyptian God they may be channeling for that day. And so the truth of the matter is that we have allowed those religions to steal that phrase from us, enlightenment, that word, enlightenment. And so it would be better in order to not cause any misunderstanding to use another word or to use another distinctive of the Christian language. Well, I believe that's what's happened to the word worship. A lot of people think of worship and they think of it in different ways, right? It means different things to different people. But what did the Bible writers mean when they wrote about worship? And how do they want us to participate uh, in worship? And that's what I want to cover today. And not only today, but this is the beginning of a series on worship. Probably at least three lessons, maybe four. But today I want us to define worship. Because I believe that if the church is going to flourish, we must rediscover worship. Now let me tell you about my experience. As I was growing up in the church, the concept was we must do worship right. We got to do the right things in the right way in the right place on the right day, right? And so uh, we, we heard all kinds of lessons on the Lord's Supper, on uh, acceptable music in worship on acceptable worship. And, and the idea was acceptable worship is doing the right things on the right day in the right way, right? And we heard these sermons about Nadab and Abihu and how that God zapped them from heaven with lightning, with fire, and burned them up because they offered strange fire in worship. 
And, and so the idea was we had these messages of fear about whether if, if we didn't do worship right, then God is going to zap us like they did in Adam and Abihu. And so that's what the messages were about. And we heard prayers, may our worship be acceptable to you, which is fine. And we still have, hear those prayers today. And that's fine. And God, we do want to do worship in an acceptable way. But the idea seemed to be, Lord, help us to do it in the right way so you won't zap us. I think that was a very unhealthy view of worship. But then in the 1970s, when I first began my full-time ministry, there came a new concept and went something like this. We really shouldn't call our assemblies worship services. We should actually just call them an assembly or an edification assembly. Uh, because the purpose of coming together is really not to worship, but to be equipped and to be edified, to build up so that we can live a life of worship. Our very lives, the way we live them, that is worship. And so it, it, it encompasses, worship is a way of life. It encompasses everything, including the assembly on Sunday, but it encompasses our whole life. And the second phase of that was we must redefine worship in such a way uh, as a way that the life of God is lived out every day. And God is a change agent through the way we live our Christian life. Now, this was a biblically, uh, biblically accurate concept. Uh, after all, the, uh, the Bible says in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you, brethren, that you offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your uh, spiritual act of worship. That's the way the NIV translates that. This is your spiritual act of worship. James 1 and 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, that you visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so this was totally right, and yet they were dead wrong. And I say they were dead wrong because it took God, the ideal God, the concept of worship and praise right out of the assembly. And so I think that also is an unhealthy view of worship. And so I think in the last couple of decades, we've come to the place in this country and in our churches where we have a growing hunger, a desire to, to, to meet God. And I, I believe we're coming to the point where we want this assembly to be about God. We, we want to meet God as, as the beckoning host, not as some great zapper who would zap us if we do something wrong, and not just uh, as a change agent who would only be concerned about us living better through the week, although he does want us to live better through the week, but not just that, but we want to come to a God who would embrace us who wants to dwell with us, who wants to fellowship with us. And we want to honor him because of his majestic nature, because of who he is, because of his, because of his power and because of his love. We want it to be man and woman and God together in true worship. We want to worship where God is the recipient of our worship and he is the giver of his presence. And we've talked about before how that that's all God has ever wanted is to be with his people, to live with them. He started out that way in the Garden of Eden and mankind messed it all up. He came down then in the, uh, uh, in the Mosaic age in, in the temple and, and, and the people messed that up. So then he came down as Jesus to dwell among us and we killed him. But he set that up as a way so that eventually we all can just walk with God in the peace of a new garden that he is setting up and established for us. So what about worship? What is it really all about? Well, let's look at some Greek words. 
The words that uh, during the Bible times and, and before, I guess, that the Greeks used for worship of their gods, their many gods, was the word sebamai. Sebamai had the physical sense of shrinking back in awe or fear. It had come to mean both an attitude of, of reverence, but also acts of devotion for this God that they feared or were in awe of. Now, the Jews hardly ever used this word. It was interesting that, you know, the Old Testament was written first in Hebrew and Aramaic. And then it was translated into Greek into the Bible called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the Bible probably that Jesus used. It was there in the days of, the, of New Testament times. The Septuagint written in Greek, if you look in the book of Job, where the devil pointed to Job's righteousness, or when God pointed to Job's righteousness, the devil said, does Job fear God for nothing? And the word, the Greek word that translated fear there in English is sebamai. So what Satan is, is implying here is that Job was just paying his dues. He was only worshiping God because of the way God was taking care of him. In other words, he was worshiping God so that God would be good to him and not mean to him. Right? Sebamai. And so all of his religious devotion was merely an insurance premium to pay for God's good will. That was the implication of Satan. In Isaiah 29 and 13, Hannah wanted a son and she prays to God and she says there, well, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's in 1 Samuel. Right now I'm in Isaiah. In Isaiah 29 and 13, uh, the Lord says, these people honor, uh, draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They are worshiping me by the rules of men. Now that's an impo important passage because Jesus then paraphrases that, quotes it in Matthew chapter 15 when he said these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so what Jesus is implying is that whatever worship they had, it was empty, it was vain, it was pointless, it was insincere. And that is the kind of worship that seven mile worship is. It's empty, it's vain, it's pointless, it's insincere. It's only to find out whether or not God is going to treat us good or not. But a new word was formed, a new Greek word. It was eusebia, and it, it means good worship. Uh, it had to do with doing your duty out of polite respect. A Eusebius person was devout. He was properly religious. Out of respect for his gods, he lived well. He cared for his family. He observed the proper rituals. He had the positive mental outlook and was an outstanding member of his community. Does that sound familiar? That's what a lot of people think today. Well, I'm a good person. You know, I don't rob, steal, or lie. I don't step out on my mate. I treat other people well. I'm involved in the community. I'm a good person. I must be a Christian. I must be going to heaven, right? That's a Eusebius person. When Paul was addressing the God-fearing Athenians on Mars Hill, he alluded to a, a, a form of the word sebamai in some of his speech, but then he said, but this God that you worship unknowingly is the one that I want to talk to you about. And the word that he used there for worship was Eusebia. The one that you show some devotion for. Paul, he's saying, out of polite respect, you have done your duty to this God, even though you didn't know who he was. And so uh, he's saying, you've done that, but I want to talk to you about who he really is. Now, the word that the New Testament writers used 
was proscunio. This means a kneeling in front of, a leaning forward to kiss. It's, it's, a, it's a posture of humility. It's the posture of a servant. Vines in his New Testament word study says that proscunio means observing an act of homage. And so a semi person says, God, you scare me to death, therefore I'm gonna do just what I need to do so that you'll treat me good and not treat me bad. <coughs> the Eusebia person says, yes, God, you have arranged things very nicely and I understand that if I do things the proper way and, and I do good things, that good things will result. So with all my dignity intact, I'm going to live wisely in this wonderful world that you have set up. The proscunio person says, God, you are great. You are majestic, you are wonderful, you are awesome, you're much greater than I am. And, and so out of humility, I don't shrink back from you because I trust you. And I don't run away from you because I want to be yours. And so I offer myself as a servant, humbly trusting in your grace and your mercy. Friends, that is biblical worship. Less of a shrinking back in fear and more of a bowing down in humility. Not some sort of payment to God to get him to do something nice for us, but a humble honoring of a supreme and holy and majestic God, the creator of the world, the one who loves us more than we can even love ourselves. That is biblical worship. Now, when I talk about biblical worship, I'm talking about worship from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. If we just depend on the New Testament, I think we'll get an impoverished view of what worship is all about because the Bible of the New Testament church was the Old Testament, right? And so a discussion of worship just from the New Testament really is deals primarily with correctives concerning things that, that they, had, they had gone wrong in, in their church family and in their church assemblies. So it deals very little with worship per se. And so I think it takes both the Old Testament and the New Testament to get a valid understanding, a balanced picture of what worship should be about. Now, of course, we understand there's things that are different this side of the cross. We, we know that our means of approaching God is now through Jesus Christ, our new high priest, in contrast to the old priesthood of, of, of the Mosaic law. But you see, the Bible is continuous. And we are the same. We're still the, the needy, sinful creatures, just as they were in the Old Testament time. And God is the same. His nature is not changed. And the truth is the same. Salvation is by grace through faith. That's always been true from the beginning of time until now. Now the grace is by Jesus Christ. Then the grace was in a direct contact with God. And so uh, it's, it's different and yet you have to look at them from both Testaments to get a balanced view. So let's look at worship defined through both Testaments. And the very first thing and the very most important thing is worship is about God. It's not about us. You know, a lot of people come to church, well, I'm going to go to this church and I'm going to see what I get out of it. And so we've come and we are the spectators and the people who are performing, the preacher, the song leader, the, the uh, communion message and, and all of that, the, they are the ones who are entertaining us or supposed to be building us up and edifying us and we are the audience. But friends, I'm gonna tell you, God is the audience. 
He is looking at us to see if we worship him, if we really honor him, if we really love. He wants us to love him because he loves us. And so it's about him. It's not about us and what we may get and what we may want, what we may want and what our comfort zone is. It's about God. And now I can talk about 1 Samuel 2 and 2 where Hannah prayed. She said, there is no one holy like the Lord. Now, holy means set apart, right? There is no one set apart like God. God said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. There is no one set apart like God. There's no one else like him. He is holy. And that's what this worship service is about, is about him. It's not about us. And so we have to understand who God is and understand who we are in contrast to him. Weak, sinful, needy, flawed individuals. Friends, we are all flawed. We all have our problems. So worship is funda fundamentally praise of a majestic God. It's our response to God for who he is and what he's done. In the Old Testament, you read words like Hallel and Gada. Hallel means praise. Gada means thank or bless. And so Hallel Yahweh, that's praise God. We get our word hallelujah. Hallel Yahweh, praise God. And so we praise God. That's what worship is about. God is holy, and his holiness elicits worship. In Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah gets his call to preach, to be a prophet, Isaiah sees a vision of God, high and lifted up, and his train fills the temple, and around him fly seraphims, they each have six wings. With two, they cover their face. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. And they sing and they shout, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then the temple posts and the throne itself tremble from the power of God. Friends, that is worship. That's what worship is about. God is in our midst, but he is the audience. And we, like the created beings that are heaven now, are flying around him or gathering around him to praise. You know, the fact that God is in our midst is, is so amazing when you think about and consider who we are in contrast to him. Isaiah felt that when he saw God high and lifted up, when he saw the uh, seraphim flying around and, and singing, holy, 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 when he saw the trembling of the whole throne room and the smoke filled the throne room, what did Isaiah say? Oh, woe is me. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the land of people of unclean lips. And I have seen the king, the God of heaven. I am ruined. <clears throat> that is worship. When we come before a holy and majestic God and we know that we are ruined without him. That is worship. Worship is about God. But number two, worship is about deliverance. This is a major theme in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Several times you can read the, the phrase, praise his name for we are delivered from whatever distress it was. Thank God or praise God, give thanks to God for he has delivered us from whatever the distress was. Now the major thing that he delivered the Old Testament people from was Egyptian bondage with the leadership of Moses. And the commemorative meal for that, the remembrance for that, was the Passover. Now the deliverance in the New Testament is our deliverance from, from sin, from the, from the uh, 
penalty of sin from the guilt of sin. We are, were delivered by the blood of Christ. And the commemorative meal for that, the thing by which we remember it, is the Lord's Supper. And, and so worship is about deliverance. We are here to say, God, thank you for delivering us from the, from the guilt and the penalty of sin. Worship is a gratitude for what God has done for us. But then worship is usually set in the assembly. And I, and I understand that, that individual Christians are private worshipers, but if you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, the central worship was when the people all gathered into an assembly. This is the centerpiece of worship and praise in the Bible. It's when we assemble together. Worship includes both human expression and human experience. By expression, we mean what we say to God or what we say about God. And by experience, we mean what we feel because of the presence and the power of God. We express thanksgiving and, and praise and adoration and we feel exuberance and gratitude and joy and awe and penitence and wonder and love. All of those things are part of a, of a worship experience. But then worship is contemporary. Now, we, we have been afraid of that word now for several years, contemporary, because some churches have changed to what they call a contemporary worship. Some churches have two worships. They have a contemporary worship and they have a, a traditional worship. But we need not be afraid of this word contemporary because contemporary just means current or belonging to the same period. Worship is a human response to the majesty of God, right? And so by a contemporary worship, we mean a response that we make to God in the language and the forms appropriate to the time and the place. Okay, think about that. It just means a worship that's appropriate for the language and the forms appropriate to the time and place. Back in the 1980s, last part of the 1980s, I went to Guyana in South America on two, on two mission trips. Their worship was a lot different from ours. Now they spoke English, but it wasn't exactly, it was sort of a pidgin English, because it used to be English dominated and they got their independence. Uh, and I had a hard time understanding them, and I'm sure they had a hard time understanding me, especially when I was preaching in this church building with a tin roof and a rainstorm came. You're talking about loud, and there's no loudspeakers, uh, no microphones to speak in. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting off the point there. I just remembered that screaming out my message, <laughs> that rain coming down on that tin, tin roof. But the thing was, it was different, but it there was not wrong. It was contemporary. It was appropriate to the language and the forms of that time and that place. I've been to Nicaragua several times on, on uh, mission trips. They speak Spanish. I don't understand but just a few words of that. But the worship that they have, the Lord's Supper, the way they do that, the singing, everything, it's different but it's not wrong. It's, it's contemporary. It's appropriate to the time and the place. And you can go to England or India or Africa and, and it's all going to be other sections of the United States. It's going to be different. I have preached for some of our churches of Christ that were predominantly uh, African American, black people. And, and I'm going to tell you their worship is different. They get into worship differently than we do. Is anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. God bless them. I tell you, it got me fired up uh, because they really worship the way I think we ought to worship. And, and so what I'm saying is 
worship should be contemporary. It should be what is appropriate for the time and for the place. But here's an important one. Worship be, begins with a hungry heart. Let me say this. The heart of worship is worship from the heart. The Bible says to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Jesus said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus told the woman at the well, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And all these verses just means that worship uh, from the heart is not about some external happening, some external hocus pocus conducted at the right place in the right time with the right people. No, it's worship from the heart. It's one individual and a group of individuals connecting with a holy and majestic God. Our response to him for his goodness, for his power, for his love. That's the beginning of worship is a hungry heart. Did you come today with a hungry heart seeking out God? And then worship results in change. Worship will sensitize us to the nature and the power of a holy and majestic and loving God and then our hearts will be changed and that will be expressed then in compassionate service and in evangelistic fervor. Next week I'm gonna talk about worship and evangelism. How that worship inspires an evangelistic spirit. But the ultimate result of all of it is that God is glorified and that's the purpose. God is glorified. So let's summarize. We said the reason we worship is God. The expression of our worship is in word and praise. The experience of our worship includes feelings of awe and, and sorrow and joy and penitence and jubilation. There's feeling involved in it. Sometimes I look out at an audience not so much here at Mandarin, but I have been in some where I look out and looks like the people have been born on the dark side of the moon, weaned on a dill pickle. You know, they've got such a sour look. We ought to be having feelings of exuberance and joy and, and, and peace and love, all of the things that, that this God will engender in us. We ought to be showing it. If you're happy, let your face know it, you know? And the results of our worship are that God is exalted, we are changed, and ministry is generated. Did you come to worship today with a hungry heart? Are you looking for a God who loves you? Are you looking for a Jesus who has sacrificed his very life for you? Then he, they're all available, and they want you to come. And we ask you to come while we stand and sing together. I will call upon the Lord.